the anti-intellectual nation tonight. Awesome. We've been talking about the meanings of America. Another word is the myths of America, the stories that we live by as a nation that shape us, that actually give us our identity. These stories are not typically out in front. They're usually kind of in the background, so we're trying to pull them out in front uh, and examine them. The deepest, most profound stories are usually kind of humming back there. Kind of hard to lay them out and say, this is my story. I mean, you can do that, but I can guarantee you there's a story behind that story, right? That's shaping that story. So these stories we've been talking about are the native nation, the religious nation, the immigrant nation, the destined nation, the self-reliant nation, and last time, the capitalist nation. This time, the anti-intellectual nation. Um, I will say again, because it's pretty cool, that this course developed naturally from the other two courses. So we went from world religions to gods and monsters to America. Okay, that works for me. So, uh, I rarely, I never make these lectures about one book, but tonight's an exception because this is one hell of a book. Uh, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, Richard Hofstadter, published 1963, Pulitzer Prize 1964. So yes, it touched a cultural and a mythological nerve and still does, just ask my Lyft driver. It, I don't know that I'd recommend reading this book. It's incredibly dense. But if you wanted to understand American history and you wanted to do it in one book, that's the book. Spend some time with the 500 pages and you're going to cover everything. You're going to cover things you've never heard of before. And it's all going to be put into this narrative that is compelling and the writing is beautiful. Um, and it, it has, it's a unique voice in scholarship of American history. Nobody's ever written history like this. It, it's conceptual history, right? It's, it's taking a concept and following it through into various arenas, as we'll see. But it also has a very popular readership. So people read it and still refer to it. It was 1963. Um, and it has... You know, every scholar is going to get critiques. That's what we do. We critique each other, and uh, three people read us doing that. That wasn't the case here. It touched such a nerve that he got some pretty vicious critiques, but he also got some very high praise. So, there he is. Looking a little purple tonight. Sorry about that. Interesting, the context. 1963. So um, it's a response to McCarthyism in the 50s, right? Um, again, just putting things in, in context here. Where Joseph McCarthy, a congressman from Wisconsin, went on a witch hunt. It became the inspiration for the Crucible uh, because it was a 20th century version of the Salem witch trials. You know this story, I think, especially living here, right? Blacklisting all that, communists everywhere, right? Even in the State Department. <clears throat> uh, hearings, uh, people's lives were ruined, horrible. Um, and in the election during that time was a very, uh, well, he was uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, he was a general. And he was kind of a plain spoken guy. You know the guy. Um, I'm trying to phrase it correct. I don't want to say he wasn't smart, but the perception was that he wasn't smart, right? Versus Adlai Stevenson, a brilliant man who had written books, uh, political science books, sociology books, uh, very articulate, very erudite. Stevenson lost twice uh, to Eisenhower, and the intellectuals of the time just could not get over it. Maybe you know how they feel. Um, 
Arthur Schlesinger, a famous historian, he was kind of the White House historian, Kennedy had him in there to, to write the history, he said, the intellectual is on the run in today's society. This was uh, 1960s. On the run? Yeah, as a matter of fact. So what I love about Hofstetter, one of the many things is he makes no bones about this. He's like, this is a personal uh, response to the defeat of Stevenson. He's like, and, and to the, the overturning of the intellectual tradition in America. And he said, I wanted to figure out what had happened. Maybe you feel the same way. First of all, let's understand what he's talking about, because this is part of his genius. All right? It's the definition. Listen to this. Um, and he's defining anti-intellectual and intellectual here. So, the common strain that binds together the attitudes and ideas. First of all, attitudes and ideas. We're not talking about social class. We're not talking about credentials, PhD. We're not talking about professionalism. We're talking about attitudes and ideas, which I call anti-intellectual. Listen to this. Is a resentment of, a resentment and suspicion of the life of the mind. A resentment and suspicion of the life of the mind and of those who are considered to represent it. And a disposition to constantly minimize the value of the life of the mind. He hit it, didn't he? I think he hit it. Now, here's the other part. Again, new thesis. No one had ever thought about this. Anti-intellectualism is founded in the democratic institutions and egalitarian sentiments of this country. Let me say that again. Anti-intellectualism is founded in the democratic institutions and egalitarian sentiments of this country. And we're going to see exactly what he means by that. The intellectual class, whether or not it enjoys many of the privileges of the elite, is of necessity an elite in its manner of thinking and functioning. He's talking about you. You wouldn't be here if you weren't an intellectual tonight. Right? So he's talking about you. Intellectuals in the 20th century have thus found themselves engaged in incompatible efforts. They have, <laughs> I love this language, they have tried to be good and believing citizens of a democratic society and at the same time to resist the vulgarization of culture which that society constantly produces. Ringing true for anybody? It is rare for an American intellectual to confront candidly the unresolvable conflict between the elite character of his own class and his democratic aspirations. Ouch. Ouch. It is difficult. For an, is rare, sorry, for an American intellectual to confront candidly the unresolvable, unresolvable conflict between the elite character of his own class and his democratic aspirations. I remember this distinctly. I remember getting a PhD, and if you had asked me, I wouldn't have said I had changed classes because I was poor, but I had changed another kind of class. I had become an intellectual. I had the credentials to prove it. And it was a little exhilarating. I now had moved up from my hillbilly heritage in the Appalachian Mountains. I was now an intellectual. Lost my accent, changed it. I was a different person because of my intellectualism. I don't think it's bad, but I changed my class. I changed my identity because now I had a story, a different story. Yeah. He has a, a little uh, chapter called On the Unpopularity of the Intellect that I just love. So <clears throat> he, he distinguishes between intelligence and intellect. So intelligence is good. It's an excellence of mind. It's practical. It's goal-oriented. Um, and an, a man of intelligence or a woman of intelligence can fix a tractor or a car or get through a problem. That's intelligence, that's good. Intellect, however, is critical. 
And, and that's exactly right. The intellect analyzes. The Greek word for analyze means to loosen up, to cut up, to break apart, right? So he's, the intellect is critical, creative, contemplative. Well, this is, this is Hofstetter's exhibits, and I, I put them in there because they seem so quaint now. <laughs> they really, so yes, the, the, um, the first usage of the term egghead was 1952 by a conservative novelist named Louis Bromfield. I'll read you this. Egghead, a person of spurious intellectual pretensions, often a professor or the protege of a professor, essentially confused in thought and immersed in the mixture of sentimentality and violent evangelism, a doctrinaire supporter of middle, middle European socialism as opposed to Greco-French American ideas of democracy and liberalism, uh, 1952. Subject to the old-fashioned philosophical morality of Nietzsche, while, which frequently leads him into jail or disgrace. A self-conscious prig, so given to examining all sides of a question that he becomes thoroughly addled while remaining always in the same spot, an anemic, bleeding heart. Ouch. All right. So, again... These are just so quaint, given our reality today. Um, oh, there, Eisenhower again, famous quote, probably taken out of context, but gets repeated this way. An intellectual is a man who takes more words than necessary to tell more than he knows. All right, that's good. So here's, uh, here's the Gluck hearing again, 1957, so quaint. Uh, this is Senator Fulbright questioning the nominated ambassador to Ceylon, all right? So this, in, in that time, was considered pretty rough going. Fulbright, what are the problems in Ceylon that you think you can deal with? Gluck, well, one of the problems are the people there. I believe I can, I think I can establish, unless we, again, unless I run into something that I have not run into before, a good re relationship and a good feeling toward the United States. Do you know who the Prime Minister of Ceylon is? His name is unfamiliar now. I cannot call it off. Again, this was just such a breach of protocol that Hofstetter put it in his book. Here's Billy Graham, 1958. Hang on. Moral standards of yesterday to many individuals are not standard for today unless supported by the so-called intellectuals. I sincerely believe that partial education throughout the world is far worse than none at all if we only educate the mind without the soul. Turn that man loose upon the world who has no power higher than his own. He is a monstrosity. He is but halfway educated and is more dangerous than though he were not educated at all. You can stick a public school and a university in the middle of every block of every city in America and you will never keep America from rotting morally by mere intellectual education. During the past few years, the intellectual props have been knocked out from under the theories of men. Even the average university professor is willing to listen to the voice of the preacher. Apparently things were getting a little better. In place of the Bible, um, we have substituted reason. Oh, here, this, I like this. In place of the Bible, we have substituted reason rationalism, mind, culture, science, worship, the working power of government, Freudianism, naturalism, humanism, behaviorism, positivism, materialism, and idealism. This is the work of so-called intellectuals. Thousands of these intellectuals have publicly stated that their morality is relative, that there is no norm or absolute standard. <laughs> I also like, okay, I'm going to read you all these, I guess. Uh, I'm not going to give you the context, just listen. It sounds so familiar. Um, 1946, again, a um, congressman. The average American does not want some expert running around prying into his life and his personal affairs and deciding for him how he should live. 
And if the impression becomes prevalent in Congress that this legislation is going to establish some sort of organization, here it comes, I love this, in which there would be a lot of short-haired women and long-haired men messing into everybody's personal affairs and lives. So you can never just keep it rational. You got to be like, hmm. Um, inquiring whether they love their wives or do not love them and so forth, you are not going to get this legislation. All right. Where does this come from? In a chapter called Religion of the Heart, Hofstetter looks at religion. Uh, and he finds it, this anti, well, he finds intellectualism in, Pro, in Protestantism. Um, here, here's a quote from him. The, so it's, this is going to be interesting. Let me just tell you where we're going. We're going. For the intellectual heritage of the United States, we're going to the Puritans and the Founding Fathers. All right? Remember, they did not, they have nothing else in common besides that. This is Hofstetter. The American mind was shaped in the mold of early modern Protestantism. Religion was the first arena for American intellectual life, and thus the first arena for an anti-intellectual impulse. Anything that seriously diminished the role of rationality and learning in early American religion would later diminish its role in secular culture. Um, all right. <clears throat> Moses Coit Taylor, uh, American historian. In its inception, New England was not an agricultural community. We again talking about the Puritans. Not an agricultural community, nor a manufacturing community, nor a trading community. It was a thinking community, an arena and mart for ideas. Its characteristic org organ being not the hand, nor the heart, nor the pocket, but the brain. Well, as we remember from our previous discussions, there was a violent reaction against both Puritanism and the Founding Fathers, uh, spe specifically in the two great awakenings in America. Oh, by the way, I wanted to mention the qualifications of ministers. Remember, it was Puritans who began Harvard and Yale, right, and demanded that their ministers have higher education. And you can look at especially Protestant denominations today and see the demarcation line here. So if you want to be a minister in the Presbyterian Church or the Congregationalist Church, you're going to have to have an advanced degree. If you want to be a minister in, say, a Baptist church like where I grew up, you don't even have to read. That's not an exaggeration. I remember growing up with illiterate preachers, but they had the spirit. So. Um, so yeah, the Great Awakenings happen. Remember, the Great Awakenings are a reaction against uh, the Founding Fathers and the establishment of America as a liberal, small l, Enlightenment nation, right? Founded on the principles of the Enlightenment, that is, reason. A couple of these evangelists are Dwight L. Moody, who said this, I have one rule about books. I do not read any book, <laughs> unless it will help me understand the book. I would rather have zeal without knowledge, and there is a good deal of knowledge without zeal. Billy Sunday, another firebrand. Thousands of college graduates are going as fast as they can straight to hell. <laughs> if I had a million dollars, I'd give 999999 to the church and one dollar to education. I think that's our new education policy. Uh, when the Word of God says one thing and scholarship says another, scholarship can go to hell. And you remember the Scopes trial in my home state of Tennessee, uh, 1925. Some poor schmuck of a science teacher was just teaching the textbook, and it was evolution, <coughs> Darwin, um, natural selection. And if Tennessee had passed a law that just before that, or maybe it was that year, saying that evolution could not be taught in schools. And so he taught it, and you know, it was a big show trial. William Jennings Bryan, who uh, was a presidential candidate um, later, I think, and then the famous Clarence Darrow for the defense. It, it, I think he ended up paying a fine or something, but that wasn't the point of the trial. The point of the trial was to 
try to settle this issue of anti-intellectualism in America. Um, <laughs> William Jennings Bryan, all the ills, all of the ills from which America suffers can be traced back to the teaching of evolution. It would be better to destroy every other book written and save just the first three verses of Genesis. Politics of democracy. So he talks about religion, then he talks about uh, politics. That's our old friend Andrew Jackson, who's been in the news lately because he is uh, similar. Uh, he, John Quincy Adams was the last kind of intellectual president, and then came Andrew Jackson, who ran on anti-intellectualism. Um, now, America, as I've said, and we looked at, so remember, we have, we have America as an Enlightenment project, right? France was the same way a few years later. It's an Enlightenment project. The Enlightenment is about the ascent of reason over faith. It's, a, it's the ascent of the university over the church, right? And the, America is a product of that. America, the country. Sure, the Puritans were, did not found the country, right? They just came here and did their thing. They didn't say, oh, let's make this a nation. It took Enlightenment thinkers like Jefferson Franklin, Alexander Hamilton to make nature's nation. Because remember, what they read was not the Bible, they read the book of nature. And they said, this is what we see, it's rational, and here's how we create a nation. A democracy, it must be a democracy, etc. But then here comes Andrew Jackson, Jackson in 1828, and just plows through all that. Uh, and later uh, will be the Gilded Age. Um, sorry to moving so quickly here, but I want to get through some stuff. Only until Teddy Roosevelt, the early 20th century, the late 19th century, do we get the rise of the expert, because now we're national power, and we need to know things. We might need to know Sanskrit. We might need to know Spanish especially if we're going to get in a war with Cuba and the Philippines. It might be good if somebody knew Spanish, right? Uh, so the tide starts to turn, and Hofstadter is very good about showing that this is an ebb and flow of anti-intellectualism. Uh, and he points out FDR's brain trust to create the New Deal. FDR was famous for keeping politicians away from him. He wanted thinkers, <laughs> not politicians, okay? Now, the practical, so religion, uh, politics, business, what he called, what Hofstetter calls the practical culture. Remember, uh, last time in the capitalist nation, how that story, that myth, fused so many things. It just crystallized the story of America in, in an overwhelming way as a chosen nation, as nature's nation, as a destined nation, as the self reliant nation, as all these things. It just coalesced around this story of capitalism, right? Um, and capitalism is a competing myth to the intellectual nation, right? Well, if only because the intellectual nation is a nation that critiques its own stories. Capitalism does not abide critique, right? Um, there's, there's also in business, especially in, during the Gilded Age, but still, a contempt for the past, a contempt for history. Why? Because, well, I want to get to that. Um, the, there was a saying in the uh, late 19th century, a country without monuments or ruins. That's what America was, a country without monuments or ruins. That was considered a good thing. Because what's the alternative? Europe. We don't want to be Europe. All those monuments and ruins. You may have heard Henry Ford's famous saying, history is bunk. do not want to talk about history. He's making history, you know? Don't bother me with history. Self-reliance. Uh, wealth equals genius. We talked about this last time. To be wealthy is to have intelligence. It is not to be an intellectual, but it is to have intelligence. Why? Because you must know something if you're rich. What an amazing assumption, right? That you must know something that I don't know because you're rich. You must know something. Not that you did something, not that you inherited something, not 
you must know some secret that I don't know, Blake. And not a sinner, exactly. So, yeah, all this comes into play just beautifully. These myths start to converge here. Nice. Practicality is the best use of the mind. Remember we talked about Jefferson and um, Crevecoeur as who put forth the farmer as the ideal American. So we don't want no professor. We want a farmer. We want a man who can fix a tractor. We want a man who can plow a field. No, I mean, this is it, right? This is the tension that he's talking about. Those people, they're ignorant because all they do is work with their hand. Is that what you meant, kind of? Well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but they can't, they don't know Shakespeare, or they can't analyze an argument. That's your point. Yeah, I think that's right. We're actually going to see that in the story of education. Next. Oh, well, let's just do that. <laughs> Education and a democracy, exactly where you're going here. Uh, I like uh, the Hofstetter's language is just beautiful. In, in the opening to the chapter on education, he says, Our per it's remarkable that America has a persistent, intense, and sometimes touching faith in the efficacy of our popular education, which is true. We do have that faith. And then he goes on to say our inability and unwillingness to make it work. Uh, again, this is the myth of practicality over the myth of intellect, right? We don't want students asking questions. We want them finding answers. And more than anything, we want them doing things. This is America <clears throat> as a pragmatist nation, by the way, which is an, the unique American philosophy, John Dewey. Charles Sanders, Peirce, et cetera. So the teacher becomes an interesting symbol in American culture. The teacher is vilified if she thinks too much. Again, this is not about thinking. This is about learning skills, right? which goes right to your point. Because if you have a skill, you can be employed. And you can contribute to this massive American experiment. So there's actually quite a bit of anti-intellectualism in the history of education in America. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to finish up with Hofstetter, then I'm going to revisit his categories for today, which you're already doing. Uh, <laughs> Hofstetter ends the book um, with a chapter called Alienation and Conformity about intellectuals uh, and how they have fared in American history and culture. So again, the intellectual legacy is the Puritans and the Founding Fathers. But we don't usually think of them in terms of popular culture in America. We haven't for a long time, probably since the Great Awakening. Uh, we think of plain spoken folk, you know, guys you want to have a beer with, uh, you know, the, the trope. So he says anti-intellectualism is uniquely American, and he questions whether intellectualism might be un-American. Again, because of what we talked about at the very beginning, this notion of an eliteness. It's not an elite. Apparently, there's no problem being elite in terms of wealth. That doesn't contradict the American creed. In fact, that bold, emboldens the American creed. But if you're an elite intellectual, always criticizing, always asking questions, always exploring, then that might be un-American. And it certainly has been un-American and is un-American to many people. How dare you question X? Often it's our troops or, you know, but you can fill in the blank. It's actually, what happens then is, you may know this, in the early 20th century, there's this kind of uh, fleeing of Americans to Europe, Hemingway, others who, who want to work in Paris, right? I mean, who doesn't? Uh, so it's a kind of reversal going on here in the 20th century where, um, uh, well, mid 20th century, you want to, if you're a creative, if you're an intellectual in mid 20th century America, where do you need to be? You need to be in Europe. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting reversal, right? So you, if you're an intellectual, you go to Europe for freedom because there's none here in America. 
All right. All right, so um, I want to play something for you here. 